So, uh, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to the last uh, ISTL Trans Info Seminar. Okay, so we're finally we're almost to, to the summer. Okay, and uh, uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Bob Gutman, uh, AVP uh, from CXX Transportation. For those of you who are not familiar with CXX, so uh, CXX is uh, one of the largest uh, railroads. Uh, class one railroad in North America. So uh, CX is maintaining 21,000 miles of trucks in the east part of the United States. So they are running millions of trains, okay, every day. So uh, Bob has uh, 30, more than 30 years of experience in CXX company in different aspects, uh, finance, sales, operations, and uh, management, okay. And uh, Bob basically oversees the entire operations research and uh, data an analytics uh, department in uh, CXX, and uh, he developed models, okay, to serve the entire uh, company uh, using optimization and uh, mathematical modeling, uh, simulation, data analytics, okay. So uh, he has a bachelor degree from Cornell University, and he has an MBA from Loyola College. Okay, please join me to welcome Bob. Thank you for the uh, kind uh, introduction as well as the invitation to come and talk to you. Uh, I really like the fact that this is a small, intimate group because I am not a professional presenter and even though I have a lot of slides here, my objective is not to bore you with a whole bunch of slides but rather to engage you in a conversation. And as uh, Dr. Hur alluded to, uh, I have a long history of railroading at CSX and if you were to ask me what is my profession? I would tell you I am a railroader uh, because railroading is a little bit unique. And um, I apologize to all of you who came here to hear a technical talk because you're not going to get a technical talk. Uh, rather, what I'm going to do, uh, and the clicker is a little slow here, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the rail industry as well as CSX transportation. And I'm not going to go through a whole series of statistics with you, but I want to make sure I ground you a little bit uh, into what the railroad industry, because I find when I speak to some groups, they really don't understand the size and the magnitude of, uh, and the role that the uh, railroads play in the, in the country. Then I'm going to highlight a few of the challenges of what we're, uh, what we're facing with in the rail industry, the broader national challenges, and then I'm going to specifically talk about the uh, our team at CSX give you a little bit of intro into the people as well as a long list of projects. So we'll spend most of the, the, the time talking about the, uh, the, the projects. Uh, again, as I said, this is not meant to be a formal presentation, so if you have a question, uh, I'm going to watch the clock because I do want to be respectful of people's time. We will, we will stop right on time, but I will try to address uh, questions or at least we'll allow you to ask the question and we may wait till the end to, to address it. So, all right, so let's go through. A uh, little bit about the rail industry. So what you need to understand, we are part of the global supply chain. And I emphasize global because I have seen a lot of changes in our company over the last 30 years. Uh, no surprise there. If you look, and these are 2014 statistics, and this is for the entire railroad industry, not just CSX, our single largest uh, area is intermodal. Now, does everyone understand what intermodal is? This is containers and flat cars, excuse me, uh, trailers and containers that go on flat cars. And the, the key to them is it's truly multimodal in that they're either coming directly from a ship or coming from a truck going on to a flat car, being transported to another location, and then their final delivery is also either onto a, a ship or another mode of transportation. That is now the biggest section by far. Years ago, the largest commodity by far was coal. And we're going to highlight in uh, detail some of the declining trends in the coal industry and what the ramifications are for, for us. Uh, but you can see just about every commodity we handle or touch in, in some way. Uh, and they're big volumes, and it does have global reach across the entire uh, North American. And last, in uh, 2014, we handled 21, 29 million carloads. So it is, it is big business. Uh, the other thing you need to know is that the railroads are a highly 
capital intensive industry. And I would tell you that railroads are the only mode of transportation that really is fully responsible for their infrastructure. Trucking isn't responsible to build the national highway system. Right? Barge companies don't build the inland waterways, they're all federally. Same thing with airports. So this is a little bit different, which is why uh, railroads are so capital intensive. So what's the importance of that? means that we're heavy fixed cost. And so uh, the other thing is that planning becomes critical because you have these high cost items that you need to be able to forecast and plan because of the lead times. It may take us two to three years to be able to put in additional line capacity because you have to acquire the land, all the environmental permits to build it. So it poses some real challenges for us. And we're going we're to hit on that. And with the increased market volatility that we've been seeing, there is also more risk out there for us. So a little bit of overview with CSX. So CSX has what we call four key routes. They're color-coded here as I flash them up here. And uh, what you'll see is we have 21,000 route miles, and we cover 23 states in the eastern half of the United States. That doesn't mean that we don't have traffic that goes to California. We do. What is unique about railroads is, is we have this interchange uh, with other roads. And so you can see along the western edge, you'll see you got Chicago, St. Louis, Memphis, and New Orleans. These are our gateways to the west where we'll be doing lots of uh, of interchange uh, with our other carriers to go across the, uh, the uh, United States and into Canada. Uh, so our service products we break into a few different categories. We have what I call our, our scheduled network which is our general mixed carload business as well as our automotive traffic and you can see the dots there represent major facilities that are used to uh, support that from a yard or terminal infrastructure standpoint. I'm afraid if I double, uh, there it goes. There is our intermodal uh, uh, terminals. And so all of our intermodal business, which you'll see in a few slides, is our largest business now, uh, needs to go through these. So capacity planning of those intermodal terminals is a big area of focus for us. So a lot of investment in ways to improve the throughput capacity and the coordination with the third parties, whether they're container shipping companies or the trucks coming in and out of our facilities. And then we have our bulk business, which I'll call, these are uh, what I align or, or compare to, think about if you're a railroad industry, approximately 30% of our trains are what I would call charter business. We call it bulk. So it would be like Delta Airlines saying that 30% of their flights are private charters every day. Now you'll see Delta Airlines really doesn't even do private charters, so it makes for some much more complex operations because a large percentage of our business is really not scheduled. And we don't know the precision of when this business and the volatility is very, very high. The other thing that uh, you may be a little bit surprised at is we also, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the overall flow. So this represents the volume of traffic on the network. So our single biggest corridor you can see is from Chicago going to the major metropolitan area of New York. That is our single biggest flow and that is double track territory. Uh, you may be surprised to find out that 70, only about 75 percent of our network is single track. So conversely 25 percent is double track. So that implies you cannot have directional movement at the same time without additional infrastructure for meet pass planning. So again, line of road dispatching becomes another level of complexity as well as your ability to handle volume because, and again, for people that are not familiar with it, I, I would liken it to if you've ever driven down a road and there is a guy with a flag because they're taking one of the lanes out of service and only one, you know, they essentially do fleeting, they let cars go and then cars come back the other way. That's 75% of our network. Mm -hmm. Think about that. So what happens is 
by adding additional volume, you are, or automatically, you are going to be declining your velocity because by definition, unless you do some elaborate queuing in the terminals, you will have more meat passes um, and therefore you're going to be slowing down. So again, this is all under the banner of some of the complexities that we're dealing with just as a, a background. The other thing that causes us a lot of headaches are these uh, things called Amtrak and highlighted there is the area that uh, Amtrak operates over our territory. So you can see if you were to take a a train to New York City from Buffalo, mm -hmm. you will be operating on CSX as far uh, east as Albany, New York, and then there'll be a separate line that they will go over, not on our territory. Uh, what I will tell you is that Amtrak essentially, for all practical purposes, doesn't pay to operate on our territory. Mm -hmm. Right? The amount of money they give us is a mere pittance compared to what our freight paying customers pay. Now, there's a long story about how Amtrak was created and a logic, so I'm not going to get into the pros and cons of that. Mm -hmm. But what I want to do is, is the uh, Amtrak, by federal law, has dispatch preference and priority on our system. So on that 75% that's all single track, you have to give them preference. Well, you got all this delay. What was that? Do they have a priority? Why they got always delayed? That's another topic. <laughs> <laughs> and then in some locations, we actually have extensive commuter operations. And the difference between passenger and commuter is the density. So in the uh, Baltimore, Washington area, essentially they're stopping your ability to run trains during rush hours. So there'll be a period of several hours where they'll be running trains every five minutes and so your ability to get a freight train in there. Now there are some additional tracks in those areas but ability to surge is very very limited. So this poses a huge what I will call heterogeneity or mixed problem for us with different operational characteristics and speeds and priorities so it becomes a real challenge and so the higher your heterogeneity or mix, the more capacity that is being consumed as if, as if everything. And so everything was running the same speed. And so what I liken an Amtrak train to, and again, you may not like this analogy, is you're on the highway and an ambulance is coming through. Because literally, you're essentially expected to slow down and move over while it goes through. Right? That's what kind of priority they get. And so it does, it does hurt you. And then uh, because we do not have perfect information very often, you'll be slowing down way, well in advance of, of when it actually comes through. So again, this slide was just meant to begin to whet your appetite for some of the complexity that we're, we're dealing with, uh, both from a geographic standpoint as well as a products and the demands. I, I get afraid to push it twice. So let me talk a little bit about the, some of the uh, volume. I'm calling this volume variability, and this is a little bit of a unique slide. It, this is not zero-based, measuring absolute volume. What this is showing is on a quarter over quarter versus the prior year, what is the change, positive or negative, in straight car load volume? And so in some industries, you would say, Wow, that's not that volume variable. Hey, you know, you're only plus or minus 5%. That's not, that's not bad at all. And then this is the recession that hit and then the recovery. And so one thing I caution you, and again, people in here will know statistics way better than I do. But remember, uh, some of what I'm showing is, I'll relate it back to a... Uh, a I call it arithmetic means versus the geometric means. So remember, a 50% decline and a 100% increase, you end up at the same spot. And so it'll show up differently on these charts because of that, because we've not zero based. So you look at this and say, this is not that bad. And you know, and, uh, over here, you're about 5%. What's the, what's the big deal? Well, that's it broken down by our major commodities. Uh-oh, it went too fast. 
So if you look at the first quarter of this year, CSX only had a 5% decline, but we had a 31% decline in our coal business. Mm -hmm. The other thing I will tell you is our coal business is by far, not even close, our most profitable business. It is all unscheduled unit trains. So this is not unique to, and I'm going to talk a little bit more, this is not unique to CSX. It is decimating the coal industry, and remember that fixed infrastructure, and if you recall where the bulk was going, we have huge sections of a track that basically have no trains running over them anymore. Mm -hmm. So what are, you, what are you going to do with that? Uh, so poses some challenges. Uh, I, this next slide provides a little bit more detail, and I don't want to get into the academic merits of the way this slide was actually constructed, but this just is meant to highlight, if you look at the different commodities we call, one of the good news is we have a portfolio effect because we cover so many different industries that if you look at the far right here, the overall standard deviation of those same quarterly changes is not very large on a relative basis. But if you go into some of these individual markets, you'll see a lot more variability. So some of our capital decisions are based to support specific markets. So like if I invest in a rail car, and if I tell you a rail car costs $100,000 and has a 40-year life, you start to realize the importance of being able to predict these. And so we, it leads us into strategies of how many cars do we own versus how many do we work with other railroads to create an industry pool, or how many do we try to work with private shippers to have them own a more private leasing company. So the level of planning and complexity increases as we strive to make money. And it's not surprising that the agricultural business or food and consumer people have to eat, even in times of recession, are some of our more stable businesses, and that some markets like metals and automotive, which are more cyclical, uh, would have a lot more variability. The problem is this coal export, that's what the EXP, as opposed to coal domestic shipments to power plants, is by far our most volatile business. The good news and the bad news is it's also one of the most profitable. So it, which of these industries are most uh, counter-cyclical? Um, so I, I thought since you meant to mention a portfolio effect, um, you might, well, I'm sure you're identifying the counter-cyclical industries and working. I, I don't know if we've identified which ones are counter-cyclical. Uh, I have to think a little bit more. We know which ones are much more stable. <laughs> But I haven't really talked about us as a hedging, hey, should we be investing in this to, <laughs> to offset that. Uh, from a transportation standpoint, I really haven't, haven't thought through, through that. Uh, so it was not but a few years ago that CSX was actively planning for 90 million tons of export coal. The highest we have ever done is in the 50s. But the way things were going with the the global supply and economics, we were actually making plans and working with uh, ports and other infrastructure to go in that direction. We had seen a steady increase, and then the bottom's fallen out, and we'll do less than 20 million tons this year. And most of that is metallurgical coal, not the steam coal, and so lots of dynamics in there. But the, the point is, this volatility makes planning and what we're trying to do as a railroad as far as optimization, both from a network standpoint and, um, and uh, our operating plans to be a, a challenge. And the relative values are what's most important there. So I have a little video clip I wanted to share. I have two video clips. Um, they're not long, but I it just give you a little bit of insight into some of the ways that We're trying to use some operations research visualization tools to explain what is happening to us operationally. Congestion, the state of being overcrowded. 
We all know what this feels like in our daily lives, but what does it feel like on the railroad? Unprecedented winter weather of 2014, immediately followed by rapid volume growth in the spring, has caused railroads to grapple with congestion all year. We know what impact congestion has had on CSX's operating metrics. On-time originations and arrivals are down, trains are moving slower, and dwelling longer. But how can we get a more complete view of congestion to better empathize with our field employees and customers? CSX Operations Research has recently developed a performance emulator that we think can help. Using the emulator, we can look back over time and replay all train flows across CSX's network, and zoom in on key parts of the network, such as the water level route. We can also add visuals to the tool to help us get a better feel for congestion, like these red dots that pop up whenever a train is moving less than 5 miles an hour, and dwell hexagons that appear and grow when a train is dwelling at a station for more than 24 hours. The period of time you are looking at now shows stable operations in early January of 2013. As you can see, when operations are fluid, as they were last year, the red dots are few and far between, as are the hexagons. Now let's fast forward exactly one year to early January 2014, a couple days before the most severe storm of the year hit the northern tier of our network. Take a look at what happened. This is congestion. Unfortunately, the storm in early January was not an isolated event. Throughout the winter, multiple severe storms hit the network in bunches, limiting our ability to recover. Then, just as the winter was ending and our service metrics were starting to improve, CSX's recovery efforts were cut short as a surge of volume hit the network. This was not just pent-up demand. It was also being driven by the acceleration of key secular growth markets like crude oil and intermodal, and more broadly, by a very positive economic backdrop. While this was a wonderful problem to have, it resulted in continued operational challenges on the water level route throughout the spring, especially west of Cleveland. As we roll forward to September, CSX continues to experience strong volume growth, and despite slow and steady operational improvement, congestion is persisting. Unfortunately, no discussion about congestion would be complete without mentioning Chicago. Due to the most complicated interchange network in the nation, other railroad service problems can quickly turn into service problems for CSX, and vice versa. As a result, Chicago has been blanketed with these red dots throughout the year. That's only the first few minutes of the video. Congestion, the state of being overcrowded. So that, uh, just the first, the second part of the video went on to explain some of the modeling we're doing to try and come up with additional capacity and where we would need it. And it then led to a multi-year presentation on this is the additional infrastructure we need to promote recoverability to mitigate some of the risks, both in terms of weather as well as some spike growth. Uh, I do have a seven minute video on Chicago that I, I'll just I'll save it till the end time permitting but uh, this event brought national attention to Chicago and uh, as a result of that there were lots of congressional hearings because one of the things about railroads is we do have a common carrier obligation mm -hmm. and so there were grain shippers that couldn't take couldn't ship the grain out of their elevators and so forth, therefore grain is rotting. At the same time that crude volume, crude oil volume, went from essentially nothing to tremendous levels. And we were running, just on CSX alone, 300 car unit trains of crude oil a day that was going from out west through Chicago to go to Philadelphia. And so that was taking high priority, uh, reducing CS, excuse me, the nation's independence on foreign oil, et cetera. So there's lots of things going on and lots of attention uh, there. So let me get back to the, uh, to the document. Go ahead and pull it up. So I will tell you that that, that uh, that video was created by our department working with our uh, communication area to help explain to our customers some of what was going on. But then more importantly, the second part of it was what are we, what are we doing to address it? 
Um, so here's the cumulative effect of what we've seen. So this is a little bit different chart. This goes back to the 100% uh, uh, index. And as you go through, what you'll see is CSX has lost here almost 50% of its coal volume since 2006. Since 2006 was shown on this chart because that happened to be our, our high period for, for volume overall. Whereas what you'll see is, is that you've seen about a 30% uh, increase in our intermodal traffic, uh, which is a compound annual growth rate of 3%. Three, three but I can tell you that it's not constant at 3%. It's very geographic specific, so you'll have that. And then overall, our merchandise, which is really everything else, so it includes you know, automotive and uh, other commodities, has been relatively bad. So the impacts of this, and again, where it poses the challenges, Intermodal, we really need to have a series of projects to help us improve our ability to grow because they are premium uh, service products. UPS is one of our biggest, most important uh, clients, and that, that we need to figure out how to improve terminal capacity. On the coal, uh, we have a lot of assets underutilized and stranded, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. But the bigger issue is, and you'll see it on the slide, is the profitability that that's lost. And what are we going to do as a company? Because Again, we have an obligation back to our shareholders. And then uh, the merchandise markets, uh, I referenced the crude oil that went essentially to nothing to being a huge commodity. How can we be fast and agile to handle this business? So the, the slide on the left here shows the uh, natural gas prices are going down, which is one of the factors of why coal is going away. There's other factors. But what I just wanted to highlight, in four years, CSX has lost $1.4 billion in coal. And on a short-term cash flow basis, I would tell you 80-plus percent of that goes right to the bottom line. So just imagine we've lost over a billion dollars of cash flow, which is, which is huge to us. Uh, what's not on the slide, remember that 31% decline in the first quarter? That's not on the slide. I can tell you our revenue in coal was down $240 million in one quarter versus last year. Mm -hmm. Our projections are that this is going to continue to go. So again, when you think about the challenges of a company, mm -hmm. our single most important commodity from an earnings perspective is going away. Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do about it? And I can tell you what we're going to do about it. Uh, one of the things we're going to do is figure out how to grow other markets. Well, we've kind of been doing that already. But the thing is, how are we going to get more productive? Well, one of the things we have to do is figure out how to leverage technology to address our highest cost areas. And our highest cost areas are labor and fuel and then all of the capital costs. So what are we going to do to drive efficiency? So the sense of urgency and importance that that decline it's a matter of necessity. And if you read some of the, the books, this notion of having a burning platform to spur on management, we have one here at, the, at, at CSX. And it's not to say we're not profitable. We just feel like we owe it to our shareholders to continue. So one of the things about these stranded assets on the infrastructure, I'll just highlight one model. So we have a tool called the Traffic Flow Analyzer. Mm -hmm. uh, that we can go through and look at different time periods over time periods, and we can look at trains versus cars versus gross ton miles to have visual representation of where it's going on. So this slide on the left represents 2015 full year versus 2014. And what you'll see in the center of our business, this is where our coal is most concentrated. This is the Kentucky and the West Virginia coal fields going there. So just imagine now go over, the slide on the rock right represents our locomotive fixed facilities and some mobile facilities to uh, repair and service uh, locomotive engines. So the question is, given this, what do we do? So CSX had built and had been working on a model that we call the uh, locomotive shop footprint model, and it does multiple uh, optimizations and creates plans that are out there. And uh, I do need to let you know that this was developed in collaboration with the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. 
and uh, we did uh, submit this. So we do get involved in uh, some of the academics, and if you're familiar with uh, INFORMS and the Wagner Prize, this was a finalist and was presented in that competition last year. I will tell you that this tool is being used to uh, make recommendations on where do we need additional shop capacity as well as where do we also take it out. And so, again, we're very, very proud of this. Uh, uh, again, there, we have a video on that. I'm not going to go into that, but there is a paper, uh, and I think if you go to Inform's website, you can see the whole thing. But again, some really good academic work being done there. Uh, we're going to skip the Chicago video for for now, for time purposes. So the other thing that uh, when you think about the major things happening at the railroad, the other one is regulatory pressures and. What I'm going to present is the bad and the good. And there's lots of different regula regulatory pressures out there, but I'm going to focus on one right now, which is the most visible, and that is the positive train control. How many people, just by show of hands, have any, any understanding of the positive train control? Okay. So uh, Essentially, after a series of major train accidents, one in particular out in California with an Amtrak train, where essentially the driver was on a cell phone not paying attention, he, he ended up getting in a collision and a lot of people died and got hurt. That the United States Congress passed a law that said, we need to do several specific things. So we need to make sure that we have technology on the trains that prevent trains from going too fast and resulting in a derailment or a train accident. We also need technology to prevent trains from colliding into one another. And we need technology to make sure you don't run into engineering workers that are out maintaining track, another form of train accident. And that you also don't get derailments by going through a signal that was not aligned in the direction you were supposed to. So this was an act, it was part of the Railway Safety Improvement Act, and it mandates that railroads implement this technology. Well, guess what, when they mandated it, the technology didn't completely exist, and the railroads are an outdoor sport. I will tell you the cost of implementing this is $20 billion. The deadline was December of 2015. Uh, we did not get it in from an industry standpoint. The good news is we were showing good faith effort. And so as an industry, we got an extension, partial extension to 2018 and a partial extension into 2020. So we have created the technology. CSX now has this implemented in 15% of the territory that we're obligated to do it. Not 100% of our territory is required. It has a criteria of where it has to be implemented. I'm not going to get into all the details of it, but from a, a, the other thing you need to know is, is that if PTC works perfectly, it does nothing. So we're going to spend $20 billion to have it do nothing if we had proper rules compliance. Think about that. Who's going to invest? So I told you that's, in, in other words, we're very interested in safety, but we don't have that many human factor train accidents to begin with. When we have them, they're pretty catastrophic. Uh, so this is not something I think the industry would have naturally gravitated to uh, just from an economic standpoint. Uh, so what we're trying to do is figure out, all right, well, how do we leverage it? Well, this technology offers lots of potential. So this is just a quick overview of how it has. So the engine gets initialized, communicates it, goes against databases, and understands lots of issues of where people are and what the authorities for movement are. Then it goes through geographic specific and creates a braking curve and a warning curve. And essentially, if you're going at a speed that will not enable you to stop at the upcoming hazard. Mm -hmm. It's going to give you a warning curve out here. If you fail to take action based on the warning, it will take over your mm -hmm. train and stop it. 
that's essentially what it does. You would think that's fairly simplistic, but again, CSX is going to spend over $2 billion uh, to, to, uh, to do this. So what we're trying to do to leverage this is to say, okay, well, here's today's current operation. Well, after we do this, we'll have the ability to, along with other factors, to be able to put in moving block operations to be able to remove all of our fixed signaling systems. You won't need it. You don't need that. It's almost like, hey, I don't need traffic lights anymore because guess what? The autonomous vehicles know what it is and they're getting signals as to what it is as opposed to looking up and seeing that, that it's a, a red light. Everything will be, so we'll be able to do it a lot more, but you can't just do it alone. What we have to do, oh, one second, there's a lot of other things. We're going to have to improve the reliability of our assets and infrastructure at the same time. Not only for implementation of PTC, but to avoid the disruptive factors. Because once you turn on PTC, if for some reason there is a failure in the system, you have manual overrides, but your operating rules are much more restrictive than they are today. So we will lose capacity rather than gain capacity if we, uh, if we didn't do this. So the other thing that this, and I'm gonna get into what all of these mean, but the other thing that this opens up, this technology, is we currently have two people on every train. Now when I started, it was five. Right? We had cabooses, we had all sorts of, of, of people, and I won't get into all the stories about what all five did, but I will tell you one of them was the person responsible to shovel the coal into it. Uh, so we hadn't had steam engines for a while, but they were still there. So we think this can get us down to one-man crews and ultimately driverless trains. Mm -hmm. So again, we're trying to understand what we can do to leverage this technology, which clearly is out there, uh, but we were going to go. So again, a lot of this, uh, lots of people working on on this project, and where do we where do we go? So, question. I, I think you just kind of answered most of it. Okay. But I was just going to say that I've been wondering why, if uh, if planes fly themselves 99% of the time during the air, and Google was talking about automated cars, you know, why hasn't the the one vehicle that travels essentially in one dimension, why has that not been automated completely yet? Yeah. So again, I, I will tell you the federal rules don't allow it to be. This technology is, is capable. So. Uh, obviously, the labor unions will be opposing this because there's, there's jobs. So CSX has approximately 10,000 employees who operate our trains. And so the potential for automation of, of these is, is clearly there. And with $2 billion of coal revenue going away in a short period of time, we need to do that. Or quite honestly, we won't have the cash to reinvest in the track structure. Are there any fully automated freight trains in the world? Yes. Okay. So there, there is a one company in particular that gets highlighted. It's called Rio Tinto in Brazil, and they are hauling iron or uh, uh, pretty much entirely autonomous. Now, again, you read different stories about have they lost capacity or gained capacity, you get mixed stories. But the technology is out there. And what I like to say on these technologies, and I don't care whether it's drones or this, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. And there's a lot of politics that go on to this. But there's more than that. I, I don't want to underestimate what we need to do to improve our asset reliability. And so are we willing to spend significantly more in the reliability of, of our cars so that they don't have failures on the line of road? And there's different schools of thought. Some people say, well, if we do a lot more big data analytics and we do predictive maintenance, we should be able to prevent them and not have to spend money. And that our overall equation could actually be less expensive and get more reliability. But uh, we, we still have a lot of work to, to, to do on that. Can you comment briefly on, on, on the sort of like the failure model? And when you talk about reliability, what could be going on? Maybe the, the autonomous car stopped working or the track broke or no it's, what, it's what, what, what is, you know it, it's a car goes through and you have a, a bad wheel bearing and it's a hot box by federal law you have to stop the train you got to walk back you got to inspect it if it if it's beyond certain temperature you have to set it off so why and remember most of the cars are privates 
Why do you have a bad wheel bearing? Why do I have a locomotive that has a traction motor fail on it? Why does, you know, again, it can be lots of things that lead us to have disruptions from the time it leaves the terminal till the time it arrives at the next location. Okay. And that's what we refer to as asset, okay. asset for liability. Mm -hmm. and including, quite honestly, the, I know there's a lot of civil engineers, or track structures, most of those, the slow orders, that's an asset for liability issue. Yeah. It's just not something that's going to, it's not going to happen in route, right? It will be known usually before that train right. starts its, uh, it, its path. So, uh, so this is the operations research team. So we currently have 18 people. Uh, on Monday, we get our 19. Uh, our staff size uh, that we're authorized for is 20. What you will see here, it is a, uh, uh, not too dissimilar to probably what you have in your engineering uh, schools. It's a very uh, multinational, diverse group. So nine of these individuals have PhDs in operations research. So we are, if I had to say, we're more heavily slanted on the heavy quants as opposed to the light quants, uh, in terms of quantitative skills. And uh, Massive uh, just finished her uh, PhD here from the University of uh, Buffalo uh, in December. So she came to join us actually in, in uh, November, and she's... Uh, learning the railroad because it takes a little bit of uh, a while, but she's doing a terrific job. We're, we're, we're excited about that. I will also tell you, and again, no, no offense, that uh, we have had some long-term standing university collaborations. The, the one that we're using most, in the past, we were very heavy with University of Florida. We've kind of gotten away from them a little bit, uh, but University of Illinois at, at Urbana-Champaign, who has a big civil engineering program as well, uh, our alliance with them is primarily on the capacity planning. The real uh, RTC model simulation, we do a lot, a lot of work with them. Other parts of CSX does work with Chris Park and on some of the safety uh, work that's out there. And then uh, uh, we also uh, had some work going on with some of these other universities, but the big one we're, we're working on. And then we have uh, a lot of consultants that we, we deal with. Some are on retainer. Uh, some of them are one-person companies that just ha happen to be the experts in their field, with uh, most of them prior, rail prior railroads. Uh, we do have a fairly extensive intern program. So I will tell you, I will have eight interns this summer working in our, working in our team. Uh, I think, I want to say most of them will all be graduate level students. I think I may have one, one undergrad student coming in. So uh, the point on this is, is we're, we're excited about the opportunity. I personally believe there's a lot more opportunity for collaborations and uh, I've been really enjoying the sessions that I've been having. So let me just quickly go through uh, some of the projects uh, that we're on. So I highlighted some of the challenges and highlighted some specific areas. But on the engineering side, uh, we're really starting to get into a lot of additional predictive modeling. and. The other thing I want to say, these are the projects that my team, our team, is working on. There are other people doing OR stuff in their respective departments. So this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. I will tell you that we're really trying to put a little bit more rigor into our project management system. And currently, we have over 50 projects currently going on. And we try to balance the projects, some more R&D related, longer term, versus here are some short-term things that have a two-week duration that somebody needs something and we're going to provide analytical support. So we even get into a discussion around what the definition of a project is. So if somebody needs analytical support for two weeks, you give it to them and up there. So predictive modeling for asset reliability. Uh, we're working on a tide deterioration model. Uh, in part, given some of the changes that are happening on our flows, the engineering department is going to be cutting back some of their expenditures, and so where can we uh, adjust some of where we install track ties? And so there's some modeling going on there. A big area for us right now is uh, rail grinders. Uh, a lot of our algorithms around scheduling, uh, very expensive assets. Our tracks are very busy with trains. How can we schedule these at the right time and get the maximum utilization of these uh, assets? 
And then the curfew planning grid is really about overseeing our annual plan. So if we're going to spend a billion dollars in engineering track structure, how do we schedule it for the whole year with all of the different forces so that you're not providing uh, track time that blocks alternate routes? Right? So you need access in and out of different major cities. And then the track time coordination tool is really about uh, what time of day, if an engineer had to go out for Roadmaster and do some minor repair on a track, what's the best time that he can get the track? Because unfortunately we do waste a lot of uh, resources waiting to get on the track. Uh, on the mechanical, uh, we're trying to come up with a more sophisticated bad order car shop router. What was in the system, quite honestly, was the shortest path. Car goes bad, what's the closest shop? Send it to it. Now what we're saying is, no, that shop is already backed up. It has limited capacity. How can we build it into our, our algorithms to send it to the best shop given the current situations? And then we've got a new project we just started on locomotive wheel wear, which really has to do with trying to gain facts on what are we really doing today on all our wheel truing. And again, some of you know what wheel truing is. But to understand, hey, is there a better mousetrap where we can carry a bigger inventory and instead of cutting the wheels to get them all in proper alignment, we can do some substitutions. And so how do we gather the information and help them with that? On the commercial side, believe it or not, we really have not been heavily involved in pricing. Well, you know, pricing is out there everywhere in the airline industry, et cetera. Well, we're now starting to dabble in that, we're, what we can do. And then, uh, uh, in the intermodal in particular, how can we get some short-term forecasts to help the terminals determine what they need to do with empty repositioning of some of their assets? So much shorter focus. Uh, uh, I will tell you that we did spend a lot of time trying to work on multi-year forecasts, and I will tell you we spent in excess of $5 million over a period of multiple years to try and get some good forecasts, and quite honestly, we we were unsuccessful. I don't think anyone would have seen the 31% decline in coal in the first quarter. And if we would have seen it, we would have been in the stock market making millions of dollars on investment uh, uh, decisions. So uh, some additional projects in the uh, service design. One of the things we're really focused on is bigger trains. And so CSX was always opposed for a number of reasons to using distributed power which is putting engines in the middle of the train. And so we've, we've changed our position, quite honestly, because our, our, our risk tolerance is a lot higher given the sense of urgency we have to get productivity. So we've, we've seen over a 20% increase in our merchandise train size because of uh, some of the work that our service planning team has done. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work on hazmat route risk analysis, which gets into all of the hazardous commodities. And there's some federal regulations we have to submit every year because we have an ob obligation to avoid uh, major metropolitan areas. And so there's trade-off algorithms that go on. So we, we're doing that. And then also, what can we do to change the way some of our trains run? Because not all of our territory has to be PTC equipped. So can we save hundreds of millions of dollars by not running certain types of trains over certain territories so that we don't have that obligation. So we're working on that. In the network planning area, which is the area that I came mostly out of, we're building a brand new line of road simulator to enable us. So the RTC model is very, very sophisticated, but you run one scenario at a time and it is very time consuming. It takes hours to run. This one we can literally run thousands of scenarios a day. And so we're using it for more academic purposes uh, and again, a whole host of issues. Lots of passenger studies. I, I, uh, you know, Amtrak wants to expand where they run the trains. I already told you we don't really get paid to run them. Okay. Uh, but we do have the ability, if they want to put on new service, to make them pay for the additional infrastructure to hold us equal to what our service is today. And so that requires a lot of modeling for us to do that. And on the commuters, especially with the state of uh, Virginia trying to operate between Washington and Virginia, 
they are willing to pay hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure to allow you to run more trains. So we're working with them, and we've been very successful in getting funding on that. And then the HHFT, I personally, when uh, the crude oil hit and we had that big accident in Canada, HHFT is the high hazard flammable in uh, trains. And so I actually had to go to New York and present to the Office of Management and Budgets uh, on this modeling and what it was going to do because they were imposing all sorts of speed restrictions on what uh, trains uh, could or could not do, uh, both in high threat urban areas, but also on the line of road. And there were all different scenarios that they proposed. But if you don't take the time to do the modeling and, prevent, and present a really strong case, uh, you're at greater risk than if you uh, don't respond. And then the field operations, one of the things we're really into, and you saw a little bit of it in that video, uh, trying to come up with new visualization techniques. So that one was using any logic software, but we are investing heavily from a time standpoint in building new Tableau visualization tools. And so I don't know if you're familiar with Tableau, but it's, it's commercial software out there. But it really, I, I call it, it's, a, it's Excel pivot tables on steroids. And it just it really enables people to uh, not only see it, uh, but also drill down capability. And then uh, we did a uh, major in conjunction with uh, Optima, a vendor. We did a proof of concept last year on trying to go up with a real, the feasibility of doing a real time yard planning system for hump yards. And uh, there were four modules in it. We completed two modules. And one of the things we quickly realized is, is that most of the immediate value we thought would uh, occur if we could eliminate train bill violations. And train bill violations is there's rules. You can't have certain types of cars be next to one another or positioned in certain places of the train. So as you're classifying the cars, if you can avoid putting them there that they have to be switched out later, you'll save work and capacity. So fascinating uh, there. Uh, the other thing that's not up there, a uh, very fascinating, and I label this as more R&D, is, is that uh, we had an uh, individual on our team that was using data mining of fiber optic signals. Mm -hmm. right? So you got fiber optic underneath, and you can you can hear people walking. They can identify the signal. It's, it's powerful stuff to identify where we have failure to couple or short couplings in the yard. So if cars go down, they're supposed to safely couple. There's all sorts of unsuccessful couples. But could we use fiber optic technology to identify immediately when it occurred to try and mitigate the impact? So that was a really uh, interesting uh, project. That one is on hold uh, just quite honestly wasn't economically feasible. The benefits weren't going to outweigh what it would take us to equip the yard with the fiber optics. Uh, on the crew management area, as we continue to automate some of our functions, we had 25, we have 10,000 T&E team, team employees that run our trains. Well, uh, we had 25 deaths around the clock that were responsible for coordinating calling these people to, to work because a lot of them are pool based and so as we automate some of the functions they're doing we need uh, to use some uh, OR techniques, industrial engineering techniques to uh, workload balance across the different geographies of the desks and so we were able to cut the, the number of desks and quite honestly we think that 80% of their functions and people will be, will be cut. So again, fairly simple but powerful. And that project probably has gotten the most positive attention because the people who would have been responsible to figure it out without our tools, they just don't know how they would have been able to do it. They wouldn't have had the confidence to make the decision. And then uh, crew balancing, and these are just some. And then on the uh, locomotive management, the, the whole distribution, we have 4,000 locomotives on our property, but how do we uh, project in the short term the next 24 to 48 hours what the supply demand will be uh, uh, across those. And then on uh, network operations, one of the things we're trying to do is train workload and the estimated time of arrival of, of individual trains. And again, this was a, we had a few projects going on, but one of them was uh, using some new machine learning techniques 
to identify additional factors that we could use to predict better ETAs. Uh, again, very, very promising. Unfortunately, some of the data that we would like to have, uh, we don't have, so we're going to have to do some additional data integration work. The other thing it did do is it highlighted from an independent source that there were certain things that we needed to work on separately, like why trains aren't making it on time, so plan compliance. And so just a fascinating, and again, this was not meant to be a, a, a complete list, but more just to show you how uh, the span and breadth of the type of things we're working on uh, is, is fairly significant. So we do ask our employees to, to, uh, to multitask. So let me, let me just uh, uh, close with a few remarks here. So one, I think the railroads are an exciting place to work if you're interested in applying your trade uh, we have lots of problems and we need smart people to uh, help us fix it. Uh, operations research and other technical professionals are going to shape the future of CSX. So I showed you that one future vision on the way we're going to be moving our trains and they may be autonomous. Uh, so I will tell you CSX recently has become more fully committed to technology. Again, we've been investing in technology for a long time. I will tell you we will probably be tripling or even greater the amount of annual capital we put into technology. And uh, the other thing we're trying to do is uh, build a culture of analytics. We have a lot of really seasoned employees out there that their natural tendency is not to embrace this. Mm -hmm. And so I was at a forum recently and they talked about what are the three biggest challenges. It was the informs analytics and there was a breakout session and they, the, the three areas that came up was of challenges is data quality, attracting and retaining people, and getting companies to change their culture to embrace this. And so I'm excited about what CSX is doing to embrace this technology. And as I said, they're putting their money where their mouth is in some of this. So I, I view it as really exciting. And just here, uh, some of the things as you're thinking about what you're going to be doing going forward. Uh, when we look to hire people, it's a given we want good technical skills. And quite honestly, if you're getting a, de a degree in this field from a university such as this, you're going to have good skills. Now, I can tell you, part of my senior staff would tell you, remind them to take programming. Remind them to take more programming because uh, if you have the ability to program, you are much more self-sufficient and can get a lot more done faster. In addition to that, things I look at is, are they innovative? Are they thinking out of the box? And do they have high energy, right? Um, again, we don't necessarily ask people to work 60 hours a week, but we want people to be excited about their projects and want to come to work. Uh, communication and teamwork. You cannot do anything in a vacuum. You are going to have to be able to work with business partners to influence change, or you will not be successful. And I self-describe myself as a railroader. If you have knowledge on the way things can change to be the better, but you don't take the time to learn the business, you're going to be limited on how you can help them. So we're looking for people who don't want to just stay in their office or cubicle and program or do this. We want to have people who want to take the time to go out to the sites and understand what's going on and add value above and beyond. And then uh, the other piece is, is that we want people to be process and results driven. So you can't just come up with the algorithms or the models. You have to be part of the team that's willing to put the efforts into not only influencing, but getting the systems changed to really change behavior. Because at the end of the day, if my department of 18 doesn't add value, we don't exist. And so we're not, as a private industry, we're not in it for the sake of R&D and academics. We're in it to changing behaviors. So that's what I have. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, two questions, so we're running out of time. Uh, any questions? Quick questions?
I know I have to go, but I, I, I will meet you afterwards. I okay. do have uh, lots of questions okay. know, regarding, first of all, um, how, how much flexibility you have in terms of setting the prices that you have regarded as a utility. I don't know if you can arbitrarily set the price or there's some regulations. Uh, another is, you know, um, given the high capital cost, you know, putting, let's say, new rods, you know, build, is it a even feasible to think about the laying a new railroad these days, uh, things like that? It is, it's easier to add capacity to, addition, to existing, existing routes, routes than create new routes. Okay. Very difficult to create new routes. Okay. I have a question. Uh, how would you, uh, do you have any recommendations on how to teach uh, PhD students those, those types of skills they don't? The, the last one, not the technical one. I gotta go. Uh, okay. uh, any suggestions on like, uh, I'll think about that. Uh, and certainly, internships help. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And part of it is also intellect, intellectual curiosity. So I have some very nice people, well intentioned. And early on, when I came into this group, I sat down with them, and they were, were going over a project, and they were trying to identify the constraints to build into the model, and they were using terminology. And it was obvious the person who was writing the code didn't even know what those things meant. Mm -hmm. So it's tough to teach that innate curiosity to say, hey, I, 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 what does that mean? And you need to be respectful, right? There's appropriate time to ask questions and whatnot. But don't just not know what it means. Uh, you, need to, you need to take the time. And actually what we like to do, and again, I have a background in Six Sigma process excellence. And there's a, an ex expression of go where the work is. And so if you're working on a project that relates to something, go observe it. Watch what they're doing. You'll learn so much more than just being in a meeting. And so practical doing that. And that's one of the things we try to do with some of our interns is, you know, get them out. If they're working on this, let's, let's go out there. If you're working on an engineering bridge inspection, but you've never gone to a bridge and inspected it, Right? And, and shadow, we like the term shadow with shadow with someone. So a, a little bit, it's a little harder in the academic environment. But let me think about that. That's true. Uh, maybe there's an opportunity for collaboration. <laughs> do you take any resumes or what kind of uh, Yes, we do have some openings. So what yeah. kind of internship are you kind of looking for? Or skills? Well, this, uh, this year we're sold out on interns, okay. but uh, there may be some in the fall. So we do have some that are not just summer. We actually like people, and again, I and ask you from a faculty standpoint whether you'll allow people during their uh, doctoral process to actually take time to go to a company for sure. six or eight months because some of our projects it's just difficult to make any headway in in, uh, in six weeks in the summer or 12 weeks in the summer. So we do have some people who, who come to us and actually several of the people who are on our staff actually were with us for, for quite a while. Okay, I know I'm running out of time. If you have other questions, you can uh, stop it and just go ask Bob. Okay, I have a gift for Bob. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank, you. Okay. thank you for your attention. Okay, have a nice weekend.